How does the brain work? The first time I started thinking about this question quite seriously was when I was in high school in Korea. And as you all know, a lot of high school students in Korea are sleep deprived, and I was one of them. And so it was really important that I figure out how I can sleep more so that I can reduce my study time. Um, and one day, as I was experimenting with various strategies to increase my sleep time, um, I realized that I, I fell asleep solving a math question that I couldn't quite figure out how to make it work. And when I fell asleep, I really did solve the problem in my dream. And even though I woke up, and after I woke up, I, I wasn't quite sure what exactly I did. Uh, in the morning when I tried again, I could get the right answer. And so um, using that experience, uh, several times after that, I tried to sleep when I couldn't solve a problem, but it didn't quite work out. Well, if we really understood how the brain worked, this might theoretically be possible, but uh, we're not quite there because we don't really understand how it works. Um, but even if we didn't have such an ambitious goal to try and completely eliminate studying, um, the consequence of not understanding how the brain functions is quite severe currently uh, in this day and age, which is that because the brain does so many wonderful things that allows us to talk, move, think, and learn, uh, when some things go wrong in the brain, you end up with, with quite devastating diseases uh, that we have absolutely no cure for at this stage. And so if you had something as simple as hitting your brain and have an injury, you could have epileptic seizures, which will make you completely disabled. Uh, with all the aging population, there are lots of neurodegenerative diseases where you might get Parkinson's disease, where you start to tremor and you can't really hold your position to be a functional human being. Also, you could have things like Alzheimer's disease where you start losing all your memory of who you are even that uh, has a profound implication where you are no longer who you are. And in doing this, we really need to, in trying to cure these diseases, we really need to understand how the brain functions. And so let's start with what we know about the brain. And one of the things we know about the brain is the fact that it consists of the basic unit called neurons, which you heard about a couple times throughout the talks this morning. And even the existence of this basic unit of a neuron is something we only learned about 100 years ago. And the reason why it was so difficult to find these neurons was because of the fact that these cells are very densely packed together where you just put it under the microscope, in a regular microscope, you can't really even see anything under the situation. And so you had to come up with ways of coloring these very sparsely uh, to even know that there is uh, such a neuron in place. And so what this neuron essentially does is take all kinds of inputs to, to, from what's called the dendrites, uh, decide what to do, uh, to fire action potentials, to let the other neuron know what to do uh, to the ones that it's connected. Uh, and these are electrical signals that they uh, send while also using chemical means to talk in between these uh, neurons. And these neurons essentially form a very dense, complex circuit. These neurons make connections locally or even very long distances across the brain. And with these dense connected circuits, uh, it fires uh, different electrical signals and different patterns to communicate with each other to elicit all the behaviors that we uh, currently observe in um, any system with the brain. However, while we know that this is a circuit that's connected, has these uh, different functions, we don't really know how it works. And let's think about why that's the case. There are a number of obstacles preventing us to really understand the brain, one of which is as simple as the fact that we have a skull that's surrounding our head. This is in place so that it can protect this very important organ. But at the same time, for scientists who's trying to access information inside this brain, it makes it very difficult to access. So many of the conventional techniques to measure things is very difficult to use in an intact brain. And also, to make matters worse, there are about 100 billion of these neurons inside your brain. And to give you an idea of what this means, um, the world population, you can think of human beings, the social network of human beings. Uh, the world population of the globe currently is about 7.2 billion. 
And so the number of neurons packed inside this small skull is an order of magnitude larger than the whole world's population. And so trying to understand how these neurons interact is not a trivial task. To make matters even worse, there are many different types of neurons. Uh, they're not all the same kinds of neuron that does the same thing. We're still discovering a lot about what these different uh, types of neurons do. And these different types of neurons are densely intermingled in every part of your brain. And so it's not like one type of neuron is in one place, another type is in another, which would make our lives easier. But that's not how it's connected, which makes the task of understanding how this works extremely difficult. And when scientists are faced with these problems, the way we attack this is to try and remove some of these obstacles as we go. And since the first obstacle was the existence of the skull, oftentimes in neuroscience, we try to solve this problem by removing the skull, take out the tissue, and investigate what happens uh, in this tissue. And in the context of understanding this network of the brain, uh, one of the approaches that uh, people take to understand the connections of the brain is to use electron microscopy. The reason why this technique is used is because these neurons, to spatially resolve them fully, you need nanometer scales uh, of spatial resolution. And to densely reconstruct how individual neurons are connected, electron microscopy is used on a small piece of tissue trying to see how individual cells, these very complex looking cells, are connected. But this technique currently is limited to being able to look at very small pieces of tissue locally. And so another set of technology that you can use to understand this connectivity is by using light microscopy with all kinds of techniques to label different cells to be different color, glowing in different ways so that you can have some idea how to sort out the different cells' connections. And um, for that, you normally use, you can use a larger piece of tissue and you can normally uh, reconstruct a larger scale connections between uh, different areas of the brain. And here, even though you can see these pretty pictures, you've already lost the details of individual synaptic connection, but you can see more mesoscale connections of these neuronal elements. And on the other extreme end, we also have a technology called diffusion tensor MRI. This technology is fully compatible with live human beings, where you can take any one of you, put it in an MRI scanner, and reconstruct these connectivities of uh, different parts of the brain. But here, as you can see, these connectivities are more like images of the freeways. You're looking at interstate highways, large freeways, but you're no longer able to see individual local connections uh, that exist in the brain. And together, all of these techniques are helping us understand how neural circuits are wired. But let's say you had all the circuit diagrams fully figured out. You know how they're all connected. It's still very difficult to understand how the brain works. Let's say I gave you a new device, a brand new cell phone. You had this in your hand. You're looking at it. You might even have a circuit diagram that shows how each elements are connected. That's not exactly, you might learn a thing or two about how it works, but what you really do when you want to learn how your new device works is to try and start pressing buttons. I press this button, see what happens, I press another, and eventually you have a very good idea of how this um, circuit functions. And so to do that uh, in the brain, what we need to be able to do is to provide a test input to a specific node within the brain and measure the dynamic activity in the whole intact brain while it is functioning. The brain, once you take it out uh, to remove the skull, it no longer has the same set of functions. So this is something that's important that it be done in a live uh, brain. And so in order to do something like that in the brain, one of the options that you can use to, is electrode stimulations. You can place as I've explained to you earlier, the uh, neurons communicate uh, via these electrical signals. So one, one thing you can do is uh, put an electrode inside a brain and measure the responses to these electrical stimulations. However, one problem is that uh, even if you place a small electrode in a local area of the brain, you have many different cell types that are densely intermingled together, as you've learned today. And so to use an analogy, what that would be like is you have a really big finger and you have many buttons on your cell phone and pressing them all together. 
you can learn a few things about how it works, but it would be really frustrating trying to understand what it does while pressing many buttons together. And so fortunately, there are alternative ways that have recently been, been uh, developed to probe these individual neurons in a, a more precise manner, even if you had thick fingers. And so by using genetic means to modify a specific uh, subset of cells, even if you have this thick finger pressing on all, all of them, you predetermine which set of neurons are going to respond to having this light stimulating a specific region. And so doing that, you can use these different colors of light to either excite or inhibit them in a very temporally precise manner, which gives us access to being able to press individual buttons on your cell phone to figure out how it works. And so this is a... Um, pretty famous demonstration of how uh, you can control neurons using light. Uh, you can see that this mouse star is starting to turn in one direction as it receives these light signal in one side of the head, uh, with, um, which is related to controlling your motor function. And so by uh, stimulating a subset of neurons very extensively in one side, it starts to rotate. And using this optogenetic technology combined with functional MRI readouts, what we're able to do is to selectively control the specific cell type, press buttons on your cell phone, and see how the response uh, uh, is measured using this functional MRI technique that is uh, compatible with human beings in a, a non-invasive manner. So you can uh, definitely try and see these uh, changes in the brain without um, taking the brain tissue out of uh, the subject. And also, since we have this powerful technology to be able to uh, individually stimulate uh, specific cell types and also read out uh, different function across the brain, one thing uh, we also had on, on our wish list is if you had to press a cell phone button, leave it somewhere, come back later, and see what happens, that would really frustrate you if you were trying to figure out how this works. And so it's also really important that you press a button and see what happens immediately so that you can decide which button to press next. And so in hopes to achieve that, we have developed a uh, real-time high-throughput system to be able to modulate these different cellular elements while monitoring its output, uh, which allows us to look at these circuitry with higher precision, um, with less frustration. And another thing you need to have in this type of a system is even if you had this precise control of individual buttons of your cell phone, if you were looking at this in a blurry screen where you can barely make out a few pixels, it would be very difficult to tell what the circuit is doing. And so it's important that you maintain high spatial resolution of looking at these images. And spatial resolution is a big challenge in uh, functional MRI readouts. And so another effort that we put in to try and improve this is to get high spatial resolution with high temporal resolution, which is a big challenge in MRI. And so if you had these three different peaks in a small spatial region of a, about a millimeter, if you looked at it in low resolution, you might think that there's only two peaks. But using alternative high-resolution imaging techniques, we're able to resolve each one of them. And so using these set of technologies to probe the brain and look at its function, try to understand how it works, um, I'll show you a few example videos of what we can do uh, at this current stage with our technology. And this is a, a demonstration video that shows us what happens when you stimulate a uh, part of the brain that's called the hippocampus. And this is a brain region that is very important in um, various neurological diseases, including epilepsy, Alzheimer's, um, and uh, more. And so what, what we tried to do was to understand the dynamics of individual cellular populations in here. One thing that's very important to note is that because there was no technology to probe with such specificity while looking at the whole brain level, uh, there's very little understanding of how these cellular elements talk to other parts of the brain globally. And this is an example of us stimulating the dorsal hippocampus. And you can see that with the stimulation of these precise set of neurons uh, within the brain, uh, you can see that this activity propagates to both sides of the hippocampus and uh, throughout uh, different regions of the brain. For those of you who are not familiar to, and looking at these images, this is the front part of the brain going all the way to the back, and we're displaying in time what happens over uh, these stimulation periods. 
And you can see that this activity in this particular case uh, resulted in communication within the hippocampal formation region bilaterally throughout the brain, but it didn't really talk to any other partners uh, within the brain. Whereas this alternative scenario, where we stimulated merely uh, four millimeters away from our original stimulation site, and you can see that this results in activity that propagates throughout the hippocampal formation all the way to uh, various regions of the cortex, um, which shows how distinct these cellular populations uh, respond uh, to um, how they communicate with the rest of the brain based on their connectivity. And we can visualize this in a dynamic fashion. I'll give you another example of looking at this using our technology. And this is a case where we're trying to see the role of specific cell types um, that resides in an area called the striatum. The balance of these two different cell types in controlling the motor function is heavily impl implicated in diseases including Parkinson's. And you can see here with the light stimulation in the striatum of a mouse, uh, you can see that this mouse starts to rotate clockwise while the other mouse that receives the stimulation exactly in the same location, but with different cell type, rotates in the counterclockwise direction. And these balances are very important in maintaining normal motor function in humans. And uh, with this stimulation, we can probe the role of these different uh, neuronal cell types. In addition to these rotations, you can see that this mouse actually has more behavior, while the other mice looks very still and have reduced activity which again shows the different roles of these cellular population. And what we can do with our technology is that we can not only probe and look at the behavior, but we can really look inside and see what the language of the activity that leads to such behavior. And you can see here on the left, uh, we stimulated uh, the cellular population that's called D1 medium spiny neurons, uh, which control this pathway. Uh, that leads to the counterclockwise rotation that you've seen earlier. The other one was a D2 medium spiny neuron, which leads to rotation in the other direction. And even if you don't know any neuroanatomy, you can appreciate the fact that they have different uh, opposite function that you can observe in the uh, different parts of the brain, which leads to these different behaviors. And so understanding these brain circuits functional language is our goal, utilizing these uh, different technologies. And hopefully, by understanding how these cellular populations uh, relate to the rest of the brain, uh, having um, its communication, find a cure to, for these devastating neurological diseases. And so I wanted to end with a note about the future. The things that inspired me, oftentimes human beings uh, express their most imaginative things through popular media. And one of the things that inspired me the most when I was growing up was uh, the Jetsons. I really wanted to have one of those flying suitcases. Um, the next was uh, Back to the Future. I wanted to traverse time, which really didn't happen. But I'm very excited to be part of this community trying to understand the brain, how we might be able to not only cure these neurological diseases and have better control of our well-being, but also perhaps we can completely eliminate studying where we would have a lot of free time for more fun things uh, if we can directly download information into the brain and even be able to do things like controlling your avatar, which is where this images from uh, where you could directly link your brain function to other um, uh, bodies, uh, being able to control them. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening and um, have a great lunch. <laughs>